In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Marianne's guests are leaders in their field, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in their own work. They teach others to develop, refocus, and grow. Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. And remember, make every moment count. Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'd like to thank all of you for tuning in today. We've got a great show lined up. But before we get started, I'd like to take a brief moment to honor our veterans. I've had many family members who have served in the armed forces, and I'd like to thank all of our veterans for your undying service that you provide to us each and every day. And to our veterans that have given the ultimate sacrifice and to their families, you are always in my prayers and have my deepest appreciation. So our first guest for today's show, his name is Thomas M. Stirner. He's the author of Fully Engaged, Using the Practicing Mind in Daily Life. So let's welcome to the show, Thomas. Uh, Thank you, Marianne. It's great to be here. Oh, it's it's fabulous to have you here. I know that you are the go-to guy in present moment functioning. And um, so we're going to probably start off with that. What is that? Well, I guess that's another way of describing mindfulness, but for the most part, uh, particularly as our culture evolves, we're getting farther and far, farther away from operating in the present moment. You know, we have mm-hmm. so much um, stimulus externally through smartphones and media that we are constantly being pulled away from whatever it is that we're doing right here and right now. And we lose the experience of the present moment, and in, in so doing, we lose a lot of our, uh, not only our personal power, but a lot of satisfaction and contentment. Well, and I can uh, agree with you there. I think, you know, just being in coffee shops or out about town, most people are disengaged from one another and looking at their smartphones or playing games. I've seen people that are playing Pokemon Go and actually, you know, like walk into trees yeah, so, <laughs> so I think, you know, being more in the present moment is, is something to aspire for. Now, I have to ask you, your book, it was, it's a fabulous, it's a simple read, it, it's got lots of great information. What inspired you to write this book? Well, originally I had written The Practicing Mind, which was published in 2012. I actually um, self-published The Practicing Mind back in 2006, and then it was picked up by New World Library, and a second edition was done. When I wrote that book, I really thought that I had pretty much said everything I needed to say or everything I could think of saying, to be honest Mm -hmm. with you, on the subject of being process-oriented and not so attached to the product that you were trying to accomplish. And I really underestimated the reach of the book and the reception of the book. The book has been tremendously uh, successful, and I've had um, I've had discussions and coachings and workshops uh, all around the world. And what surprised me was how much people wanted to talk about the subject more. In fact, I just got a tweet this morning that said the only thing wrong with the practicing mind is it wasn't long enough. Um, <clears throat> so I decided that um, out of gratitude uh, for to everybody, I needed to talk more. And and like I said initially, I wasn't sure what I would talk about. But what I found was that people tended to be asking the same questions after reading The Practicing Mind, and that was when I came up with the idea of, well, let me address those in Fully Engaged. So the books are really meant to work together, but that's where Fully Engaged came from. Oh, and so if someone's new to The Practicing Mind and, and your work, would you advise them to pick up your first book and read that and then dive into Fully Engaged? No, I think that both books stand on the, you know, on their own. <clears throat> but I think that the only thing that might, might be a little bit um, challenging is that I do refer back to the practicing mind at times rather than reiterating the same concepts again, uh, because I didn't think that would be fair to just use the same content. So there are some areas where I discuss uh, briefly. I will mention something that was in the practicing mind. But the reviews that have come in so far off of Fully Engaged have, uh, from people that have read both books 
has said that the book stands on its own, but that they also feel that it answers the few questions that they had after they read The Practicing Mind. Hmm, perfect. Well, and I know that you're an expert in not just The Practicing Mind, but a you know, musician and composer and in the technical field that uh, that revolves around music. You know, how can musicians use this to further their daily practice? Well, one thing that you have to learn when you take on any kind of an art form, actually life itself, is that it's an, it's an infinite journey. And I think that the problem for musicians, being a musician, is that we tend to feel like wherever we're at, we're not good. <clears throat> so we feel like we don't want to, once I get to play this piece or once I can play in that key, those types of things make us feel like that we, we, we create this, um, the space between where we are and where we want to get to. And when we, we do that, we, we make the process of getting there more or less our enemy because we feel like, well, I'm incomplete as a musician right now. I'm not, and I certainly did this myself. I'm not really as good as I can be. And, but what we miss is that as you evolve as a musician and as you evolve as a human being, your perception and your perspective of how good you can be is always changing. So you can't even imagine what it would be like to be able to play, say, Chopin's Nocturne in D-flat when you're trying to figure out where the notes are on the keyboard. And Mm -hmm. so your perception of what good is is always changing. And when you begin to realize that, then you realize that wherever you're at is where you should be at this moment. And the fact that you have this infinite ability to expand is really a a blessing it's not a punishment Uh, and it can be seen from either perspective Hmm. well i think a lot of creative minds suffer from that i know a lot of different artists and very creative people and they always feel like their work hasn't hasn't arrived it's not there yet and so uh, staying in the present moment would really help with that whole process of just being appreciative of where they are currently Yeah, so I think as a musician, when you're practicing, what you have to realize is that the reason that you practice is to become free in the art. In other words, um, you know, there's this, when I was studying jazz piano, my teacher said, Mm -hmm. um, in order to be free in the art, you must first be a slave to the process. So um, (laughs) when you can accept that and you realize that this is part of the, the, um, the experience of music, then you let go of this feeling of, I've just got to get to where I can play this. Because in reality, as soon as you finish this piece, as soon as you master this piece, you just automatically move to a piece that's more difficult because you get poor, bored with playing simpler pieces. That's why mm-hmm. you know, I had a conversation one time with one of my daughters when she was very young and she was listening to this uh, music uh, that really was nothing I was interested in. And she played it for me and she said um, – she said, Dad, you know, uh, what do you think of this? And I said, I was very polite. I said, it's okay. And she said, but yeah, but you're not really into it. And I said, I, I have to confess I'm not. And she said, why is that? And I said, well, do you remember when you were learning how to read and you were reading The Cat in the Hat sat and played with the bat and all that sort of stuff? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, why don't you read those books anymore? She said, because they're dumb. And I said, that's right. I said, you get to a point where – your level of understanding of reading is you need a challenge. You need to move up in a challenge, and that sort of stuff you, was right for you at that particular time. And, I, and that's what musicians need to understand is that as you move forward, it's a blessing that you can always go to something more difficult. And I have, you know, when I was a concert piano technician for over 25 years, I worked with the best musicians in the world in all the different genres, jazz, country, western, classical, not just classical pianist, but also pianists that were working with um, uh, celloists and violinists. And, you know, that's one of the things that they realize is that they enjoy the challenge and the fact that they can move forward and that they never feel like they're as good as they are. And they don't look at that as a bad thing. They always look Mm -hmm. at it as a good thing. Well, and I think that's so important to just, again, kind of kind of circling the wagons back around is to just be appreciative in the moment. And I, I love how you um, talked about that that situation or that experience with you and your daughter and just brings things into perspective because I think people really get frustrated sometimes, you know, as far as, gosh, I, I should be here or should be there, you know. 
Well, I think that it really does, what we're talking about here is applicable to life. I mean, we do the same thing. We always have this sense of uh, feeling incomplete. And Mm -hmm. what's going to make us feel complete is always outside of where we are right here and right now. And if we could just get to there, then this feeling inside would go away. Uh, But what happens is it's a cycle that we go through. And then we, we put all this effort into getting to this place wherever it is, whether it's making more money or having a new cell phone or whatever it is. We keep pushing to get to that point. But after we get there, we immediately replace it with the next thing. Uh, it never lasts for more than a day or so. And so when we can realize, recognize this tendency in ourselves, I think we can we can um, convert that energy into understanding that this is part of our DNA, this feeling of what we're interpreting as a feeling of incompleteness is this drive in us to want to constantly expand. And we're supposed to do that. That's the reason we don't live in caves anymore. So, you know, we have this drive in us to fully, to always expand, to always become more, to always realize more about ourselves and to, to develop more. And we can misuse that drive and um, let it make us feel like we're incomplete when really it's there to serve us. Hmm. That is so beautifully put. Thank you. Thanks for, for going over that. Now, I know in your book you talk about some of the ways that people sabotage their goals. Can you explain that for our listeners? Yes. I mean, one of the things that we do uh, pretty much when we make a personal goal, whatever that is, losing weight, making more money, whatever it is, we, for some reason, always attach a time frame to it. And generally that time frame doesn't have any data behind it. It's just a time frame that we come up with. And then immediately after that, we begin, we accept that as fact. And then we begin to judge our progress relative to that time frame. And that can really sabotage us. And the example that I I give over and over again, because it's so easy for people to understand, is an extreme weight loss. So we say, Mm -hmm. okay, I want to lose 20 pounds. That should take two weeks. So there's an extreme. Well, what happens is that even if you're doing everything right and you're you're on a nutrition program or on an exercise program and you're being very disciplined and true to this system that you've come up with to lose this 20 pounds, and maybe you're even losing weight at an accelerated rate but it's still healthy, you're not going to lose 20 pounds in two weeks. So eight days into it, um, you're looking at – you go, well, I've lost like seven pounds. Then you begin to lose confidence. In yourself, and you start to feel like I can't accomplish this goal. I'm not very good at accomplishing this goal, and all this negative internal dialogue starts to happen when it's all false. I mean, really, you're doing very well, but because you don't have enough information about what is realistic for accomplishing the goals, your perspective and your interpretation of your progress is very skewed. So I think it's very important when we set goals, and I've done this myself, where I've um, I've set goals and had uh, completely misinformation about how long they should take. Writing and getting the practicing mind out there was one that I wrote about in the book. So I thought maybe six months to a year and mm-hmm. much longer than that. The book has, has been very successful. And maybe it was it moved faster than I should have expected it to, but that wasn't my perspective at the time. I thought, this isn't working. Uh, do I need to go back to work and do something else? So I think it's very important for people to understand that when you set your goals, you need to take the time to do some research and have a realistic understanding of how long it should take you. And maybe you can't know that. That's another thing that you have to accept. There are some things that are going to have twists and turns and you're going to be learning along the way. And maybe some of that information is just not attainable when you first start your goal. And you have to accept that too. And enjoy the process, you know, of achieving the goal. If you, when you're in the present moment, then you're always enjoying the, the process of achieving the goal and not so attached to the moment when the goal is realized. Yeah, and and that's such a uh, a sweet you know a sweet journey then, as opposed to you know kind of just pounding the goals that we have into like oblivion, really enjoying the journey. Well, it goes back to you know what we were talking about earlier, where you know you need to learn that <clears throat> it is the process is where the joy is because this this feeling of incompleteness is going to be there again after you accomplish this goal. So how are you going to interpret that feeling? And um, if you can, like like I said, if you can convert that and, uh, and step back and understand it, the way that I'm feeling is the way I should feel because 
this is not the only goal that I'm going to have. This is what it feels like to be in the process of achieving the goal. And this is a good thing, this feeling of I can do more, I can accomplish more, I can be more. All of that is this growth, this expansion that is supposed to be taking place in your life. Whether it's being a musician and you're working on a piece and you feel like I'm just never going to get these, these eight bars here. I just Every time I get to them, I, I stumble. That's, you know, when, every time you practice, every repetition goes into um, your your growth. So, And I also tell people if you look at something like a musician practicing a passage, when you do a scale or something like that, you're not just learning that scale from that for that passage. What you're doing is you're – you're creating these brain synapses. You're freeing yourself from technical barriers so that in another piece or if you're improvising, when you have this idea that happens, your hands will respond because you have spent this time playing the scale over and over again in another piece. And it's the same thing in life. As you become better and better at learning to process situations, and the only way you can do that is to go through the situations and be conscious of the fact that here's an opportunity for me to push my threshold and grow – then those situations become easier as you move forward. But human nature is, okay, now this, you know, the things that you're good at are things you've already mastered. So we always start to push towards something that's a challenge because that's the way we're designed. We just tend to not see that, and we make it our enemy instead of our, our ally. Well, and this kind of brings me to the, my next question I have. Through all of this, and you know, there's struggle in in being able to um, get to our goals. Sometimes, if we are not in the present moment and enjoying the journey, how can we develop a greater sense of inner peace? Well, the the only way that I know, and I think that pretty much everybody has spoken on this in the past, is you have to develop an awareness of what your mind is doing without your permission because it's always doing a lot without your permission. Your mind is a thought machine, and it will think with or without your permission. That's what it does. It's a problem solver. If you don't give it a problem, it will go into search mode looking for one. And most people spend their day in their thoughts. So their mind is just thinking thoughts. It's reacting to whatever situation that comes up. And as it does that, Everybody, the people, because they're in their thoughts instead of a, more of an observer of their thoughts, they react to the emotions that their mind produces. So if a situation, somebody compliments them on their hair, they have a good feeling. If somebody says, what happened to your hair today, they have a bad feeling. And they're never separate from that. And to me, the only way that you can get away from that and have the ability to choose, this is how I'm going to feel in this situation, this is how I'm going to react to this thought – is through some sort of a thought awareness training and I would you know you can call it meditation whatever you want mm-hmm. but what meditation does is it in the context of this conversation is it accomplishes two things it makes you aware of what your mind is doing and it also builds the skill the willpower the strength to be able to corral it and say no we're not going to go down that path we're not I'm not going those those thoughts are worry thoughts. I see people and they're worrying and you say, um, what's the problem? They're saying, I'm worrying. Well, worrying is a thought. You can't, you can't worry if you're not thinking. You know, if you don't have a thought, then, you know, thought's the, the conduit. It's the thing that moves the, the emotion in, into your experience. So you, if you say to that person, well, just stop thinking the thought, the, their reaction is, no, I can't do that. Well, the, the truth is, yes, you can. It's just you haven't learned how to do it. But that's what meditation does. And it's so, it's so beautiful because it's so ridiculously simple. I mean, it's just, you know, you sit in a chair, quietly close your eyes and just watch your body breathe. Or you can say a very simple mantra over and over again. And what happens is your mind immediately tries to take over and go off. It's very clever. And it tries to take off in a different <laughs> direction. And I find that where people make their mistake in meditation is they immediately begin to judge their progress. And they judge that their progress based on how much they're chasing their mind. And they feel like if they're chasing their mind a lot, that means they're not good at meditation. But my my feeling is, no, that's actually a good thing because you couldn't be chasing your mind if you weren't noticing that your mind wasn't doing what you wanted it to. So that's really the way that the perspective that I see it from. If you're chasing your mind a lot and people say, I had a meditation, all I did was chase my mind. Well, that's because you were noticing it. And you, if you're noticing it, it means that you're improving it. Your skill is going up at becoming more aware that – your mind is having these thoughts that you're not you're not telling it to have, and that get, then gives you the opportunity to make a choice of I don't want to have this thought. Now, what follows after that is you have to have the willpower to stop the thinking. 
But you get that willpower through this repetition of just gently pulling the mind back, gently pulling the mind back. So those two things work together, and they are so incredibly self-empowering that you just can't describe it in words. You have to experience it. And it, it only takes maybe 10 minutes a day to do that. I think a lot of times when people start their mindfulness um, training or start down that path, they think that they have to spend an enormous amount of time in meditation to be able to control their mind. And when they start, they're like, wow, you know, because the mind is so active, am I even doing this? So I'm a failure at it, as opposed to that it's like any other muscle that we have to, like if we're going to run you know, in the Olympics, you know, we've we've got to improve our time every day. We've got to work at it. So uh, without, it's kind of like that realization that you've got to do the same thing in meditation. You do, and and you, I think there's there's so much overthinking that goes on to it because when people start to meditate, they go, well, it can't be this simple because they they think mm-hmm. it's this very complicated thing, and it it isn't. Uh, the mechanics of it are very very simple. The experience of it, like I said, usually when people drop out of a meditative practice, it's because they misinterpret their experience, and, and they, you know, we always we always have this judgment going on, like I got to be the best at this, I got to be really good, and I see, I hear it over and over again. You know, people say, "Well, I tried meditating, but I just couldn't stop my mind." Yeah, well, nobody else can either. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the meditative process. You know, that's the reason why you do it, and um, you're never, you know, even the most advanced. Yogis and you know saffron robes and the Tibetan uh, Himalayas, they they still struggle with. It. They just accept it. This is the practice. The practice is you sit there and you train the mind, and that's mm-hmm. the end of that. It's there is no place you get to. Once again, it's like music. When are you ever as good of a musician as you're going to be? I mean, when are you ever as good at meditation as you're going to be? If you're meditating for six months, you're way better at it than you were when you started. But your your perspective has changed because you're six months into it. Just like a musician who practices, they forget what it was like to not know where the notes were on the instrument because they're way past that. Now they're down here. So it's just keeping that perspective, I think, is very helpful. Oh, without a doubt. And, and you know what? And I know you, you discuss a topic that I think um, we – it bears to be uh, discussed at this moment is multitasking. A lot of people feel like when they multitask that they're actually doing great work. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, what's interesting about multitasking is that what we know now is that the the concept of multitasking as we think of it doesn't Mm -hmm. exist. They call now they call it switch tasking, which is much more accurate because what happens is, is when you switch when you go from one task to another, the, the mind has to stop and restart. It's just it does it so quickly, like a computer, that we don't we don't feel like we're multitasking. So there's a, a book out by a guy named Dave Crenshaw. It's called The Myth of Multitasking. It's been out for years. Uh, I actually had a radio a talk show um, years ago, and I, I met Dave through that. And it, he had a fascinating test that he gave me. And that test was uh, you could use any sentence, but the sentence that he used was multitasking is worse than a lie. You write that sentence down, but the first time that you write it, you number each letter. So you write M, and underneath of the M, you put a 1, and then U, and underneath of that, you put a 2, and so forth, all the way across the page until you've written multitasking is worse than a lie, and you've numbered underneath, and let's just say the number's tally 35. That's how many letters there are in it. And you time that, and then you start over again, and you just write the sentence, multitasking is worse than a lie, and then you go back and write 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 35. Well, what people, when you do that, what happens is you find that it takes about half as much time when you just write the sentence, and then underneath of it you write the numbers. Now, most people would think that when they're writing M and then a, a 1 underneath of you, that they're not multitasking, but they are. They're two different functions for the brain, and the brain has to stop each time. It has to go from letters to numbers each time as it moves around. So the point is is that what they're learning is that this is tremendously draining on us because it takes up so much processor on the brain. I mean, the brain's a processor, mm-hmm. and it's using so much processing energy to, to start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. And it's one of the reasons why people feel so fatigued at the end of the day because they're doing this all day long with everything they're doing. They're finding that in corporations, this um, the productivity cost factor is I don't, it's like 25 to 35 percent. If with this versus getting people to just really be doing one thing at a time, 
So I think it's really important for people to realize that when they're multitasking, all they're doing is slowing themselves down and tiring themselves out. And that gets back to being in the present moment, being process-oriented, being completely absorbed in what you're doing right now. And when you do that, it's deceptively productive. Your productivity goes way up, your um, fatigue goes way down, and your experience of working it's a spirit of, of peace because your thoughts thin out. You don't have so much thinking going on, and you feel this contentment. Uh, your whole experience of life changes. <laughs> yeah, where can our listeners um, you know, connect with you and learn more about your book and all the great things that you do? Well, the best place to start is TomSterner.com. That's the best place to start. That's kind of a landing page for everything, and from there – you can go, you know, I have the Practicing Mind Institute. There's also um, a PracticingMind.com uh, site, which has a lot of information on that book. But the mm-hmm. best place to start is TomSterner.com. They can get the consulting information, the coaching information if they want. They can learn about the two books. Um, pretty much everything starts there. Oh, perfect. You know, um, Tom, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today talking about Fully Engaged. I encourage all of our listeners to go out and pick up their copy and um, be part of your community. Thank you, Marianne. It has really been a pleasure. I'm I'm so grateful to you for inviting me on the show. Well, thank you. And uh, for our listeners, we'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. successful entrepreneur or sales professional, but you're ready to take your success to the next level, I'm Bob Berg, and I invite you to join me at our next Go-Giver Sales Academy. You'll learn how to communicate your exceptional value to more people, sell at full price, become objection-proof, and embrace the abundance that's your birthright. Limited to just 12 people, so it's personalized, impactful, and transformational. Visit GoGiverSalesAcademy.com and see what others are saying. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient secrets of manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com Ben Wexler is a gifted leadership development and strategy consultant for professionals who want to transform their organizations and careers. Through a uniquely personalized set of processes, participants discover their unique knowledge, how to leverage that knowledge and experience, and then put it all together with a global strategy. You're more valuable, your organization is more valuable, and the change is viral. Contact Ben at 630-881-1074, 630-881-1074. During times of uncertainty, challenges, and change, how do we find a ray of hope to move forward? In Amy Van Addislater's best-selling book, Moments, Magic, Miracles, and Martinis, she offers a torch of inspiration, motivation, mindfulness, and authenticity that illuminates even the most desperate of situations with possibility. Order your copy today to see what the buzz is all about at www.amyvslater.com. This is Tanya Carol Richardson, author of the new book, Angel Insights. I used my psychic gifts to get messages from the angels to write this book, and I'd like to help you get personalized messages from your own angels. Learn your subconscious blocks, make sense of the past and present, and receive advice about navigating your future in an angel reading at tanyablessings.com. Book a session with me and your angels at tanyablessings.com.
welcome back to Moments with Marianne. So our next guest, very talented lady, Leslie McGurick, and she's here to talk to us today about her new book, The Power of Mercury. So it's really about understanding Mercury retrograde, and could we all use a little help with that? So Leslie is a professional astrologer. She's been doing this for over 30 years and has taught in places all over the U.S. and in Mexico and also is very well known for her children's books, which she has sold over 2 million copies worldwide. So let's welcome to the show, Leslie. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Oh, thank you, Leslie. And, you know, um, so your book, I mean, gosh, once I got my hands on this, I was really intrigued because a lot of times people talk about, like, mer- Mercury retrograde, like as if, you know, the sky is falling, you know, everything's going to come to a screeching halt. So I was real, um, real excited to spend this time with you. And for our listeners that are kind of new to, you know, what is Mercury retrograde, can you explain that a little bit? Sure. What it is, it's an optical illusion, actually. Uh, when the early people on the planet were looking at the stars and the movement of the planets up in the sky, it was like their form of television. Every once in a while, they would notice some of these planets did strange things. And Mercury, which is known as the planet of communication, at about three times a year for a couple of weeks, it appears to be moving backwards in the sky. So it became almost like an old wives' tale that that meant things were going to go funky and things were going to go haywire. And everybody feels, um, a lot of people feel as if during these periods they don't want to sign contracts, they don't want to go on a trip. They get very nervous during Mercury retrograde. Now, there is some truth to this in that Mm -hmm. these planets do have an effect on us, just like the moon, which regulates every body of water on Earth because the tides go up and down according to the cycles of the moon. Mercury also does have a connection with communications. But the trick is that, and the reason I wrote the book is because I actually was born during one of those Mercury retrograde periods. So for me, it's my best time. It's when I should be going forward instead of what most people need to do, which is to sort of retreat and meditate and sort of put their car into reverse is the way I like to describe it. It's not necessarily a negative thing, but just think of you want to get your car out of the garage. You're very grateful that you have these reverse times. So I wrote the book because I wanted people to understand that it doesn't mean you have to be terrified. I don't want anyone to live their life thinking that the planets are in control of your life. We have free will, but it does help to know sort of the weather patterns. But the most important thing is to know whether or not you're one of those people like myself that was born during Mercury retrograde because that means it's your best time. And then when it starts going forward, we feel the way everyone else does when it's actually retrograde. Hmm. Well, and, and so I looked at your book, and I, I could see that I was born during a retrograde as well. So that means when it goes direct, then we're we're kind of, it, not necessarily, but we can kind of feel a little bit of a kind of a funkiness or we're going yes. through a little bit more of a difficult time. Well, it just means that we're more used to things not necessarily going the way we want them to all the time. So I think that the people who were born with Mercury retrograde, the, the beauty of us, those who have it, I have it as well, is that we are original thinkers. We're going against the grain of the way other people are thinking. Even the way I've written this book is very different than what most astrologers are saying about Mercury retrograde. But nobody that I ever hear ever talks about those of us who are 20% of the population that actually are living with this kind of backward feeling when everyone else is going forward and it it just is something you have to get used to and it can be a real positive it's just something to know about Mm. it'll help explain things a lot better like even with what you're doing with your with your show you're trying to be inventive and and do new things and that's very indicative of someone with mercury retrograde (laughs) well thank you i'll take that (laughs) but see i don't want people like the two of us to think oh, my gosh, doom and gloom for the majority mm-hmm. of the year. That would be a crazy way to live. And I, I want people to realize that you don't have to get hysterically upset every time it's Mercury retrograde. And then you should have compassion for those of us who live with the reverse of what they have all the time. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, and, and I like how you describe that. It, you know, we just have to be more creative. You know, yeah. we're looking at different ways of approaching things. And, and we probably, you know, 
with all stars aligned, we probably picked how we're going to show up here anyway. So we, we pick these times and dates to say, hey, you know, this is how I'm going to express myself to my fullest. Right, and it means that you are going to be living a very unique life. There are two celebrities that come to mind right off the bat that I know have Mercury retrograde. One is Angelina Jolie, and the other one is Robert Downey Jr. These are Mm -hmm. both two people who are extremely intense people, and they're different. They're sort of finding their own life path, and it's never been normal, (laughs) and that's (laughs) pretty common for Mercury retrograde people. Like for myself, I have absolutely no training in art, and yet I've made a living most of my life as a children's book author and illustrator, and have been a product designer. And so, again, it's sort of this backwards way of, of doing things. We are, we're always coming in through the back door, Mercury retrograde people. Well, you know, hey, that's good news for us, <clears throat> especially since a lot of times, you know, it, it we do have, I mean, most people I know are saying, oh, can't get into contracts, things are going to fall apart. So, you know, how, for let's say for the 80% that do go through ret, you know, Mercury retrograde and they're, kind of looking at it like, gosh, you know, I've got to be a little bit more careful. How can they make that work for them? What they need to do is what you and I need to do most of the time, which is go slow. We need to not do anything quickly. You just need to make sure you read every detail of every contract. You need to be more reflective. All the words that begin with R-E, like reflect and regenerate, renew, reflect. We want to think about doing those things, but... All I want to tell people is that if you do get freaked out during Mercury retrograde periods, it just means that you're just not slowing down enough and noticing Mm -hmm. that a lot of things go wrong all the time. It's not just during Mercury retrograde. So let's say there's someone that was born. Let's kind of take this over into like the dating world because I'm kind of, I, I think your book is really set up perfectly for single people or people just looking to, you know, have a better understanding about relationships. And that was so, actually originally what, who I wrote the book for, was, and then I realized, wait a minute, anyone can use this book, but, yeah, it's extremely useful for single people. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, it's sort of like if I'm, you know, or work situations where the deal is. But um, so let's say um, that someone is a retrograde baby and someone is a direct. How does that even, does it work? It, yeah, that's it, not it, a problem at all. It's a really minor kind of seasoning on somebody to have it retrograde. It just means that if your partner is Mercury retrograde and you're not, you just have to realize that they're a little bit quirky. That's basically mm-hmm. what I would say about Mercury retrograde. It's kind of a quirky time. And those things that fall apart or don't go well during Mercury retrograde for those who were born with it direct, uh, usually the things that go wrong are not major. It's just sort of funky little things. And they usually everything gets back to normal when it starts to go direct. But the book is actually set up um, to understand people's communication styles. The Mercury retrograde is about a third of the book, but the majority of the book is trying to figure out why is it that there are some people who are so easy for us to get along with and other people, no matter what we do, they just sort of drive us crazy. This book can help explain it because Mercury – tells us how we think, what kind of sense of humor we have, and how we use words. So if you have a boyfriend who has a Mercury sign that is very feisty and fiery, you need to know that because if your Mercury is in a very soft, gentle place, like in Pisces, that's going to be a difficult combination. It doesn't mean it can't work. It's just something to be really aware of so you don't take everything personally. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's really to kind of help us hone in our communication um, skills, and also to know a little bit more of some of the things to look for. Right. So imagine also you have a child, and let's say that the parent um, had, and again, a Mercury sign is different than your sun sign. A lot of times Mm -hmm. it's the same because Mercury in the sky is usually close to the sun, but the Mercury sign of a parent who has it, let's say, in Gemini, which is an exalted position, that parent is going to be very much about using their brain, and they're going to think in a way that's all about words. They're going to like writing. They're, they're good at communicating. If they have a child who has their Mercury in Aries, Aries is a very impatient sign. It's fiery. It's the ram. It's They want to go, go, go. They're the type who say, hey, Look, Mom, no hands. I'm just going to go. And so you have to understand that if your child has that way of thinking, 
it's going to be very different than the, the parent who has the Mercury in Gemini. So in the book, that you can read the combinations, and you can understand how to understand the other person's way of thinking. Mm. Now, you said a few minutes ago that you had written this initially for people who were single. What what inspired you to get this book together and to write this book? Well, a couple of things. Everyone kept talking about Mercury retrograde. It was so common to hear about it in the news, and I realized nobody knew what the heck they were talking about. So that was one thing. And secondly, because I've done a lot of dating in my life and I've used astrology to help guide me through the process, because when you meet somebody for the first time, especially if someone's doing Internet dating, you want to know what they really are like because you can't really tell from the first meeting. So using this book, you can look up the guy or the woman that you're interested in, and you'll get a really great insight into what matters to them because your Mercury placement tells you what, how you, how you care about the world and what you think about and, and what kind of sense of humor they have. And then when you look at your comparisons, which is the back, back part of the book, you can then see what it would be like to be with this person if you were trapped in an elevator with them or in a marriage. <laughs> you know, there's some people who, when they get under stress, like somebody who has mercury in Pisces, which is water, when they're under stress, they're more likely to cry and get very emotional because water is emotions. Think of tears. And if, some, if they're in a partnership with somebody who has that mercury in fire, which is Aries, Leo, and Sagittarius, those are people, they're very quick. They want to fix things. They want to move through problems really swiftly. And the other person's like, wait a minute, I'm still feeling all these things out. I, I'm not ready to move off this yet. <laughs> it, it can be really nice. I, I call astrology the language of compassion because once you understand the way someone is, then you can accept it. Well, and it, it makes it so much easier because we're like, okay, well, I know where this person's coming from. We get we, we really gain this greater understanding, and you're right, and, and compassion. That's know, what, and, and there are many things in a relationship that have to work. You have to have emotional compatibility, which is the moon sign, which I don't talk about in this book. This book is just about communication, and to me, you can't be in a healthy relationship unless you feel like you can talk to the other person. And there are some people who, you know how it's like when you meet them, you just can't stop talking to each other. Mm -hmm. It's usually because your Mercury signs are highly compatible. And then there is also the whole sexual area of life, which is your Venus and Mars placement, which hopefully will be my next book where you can compare those together as well. So what I'm trying to do is make astrology more user-friendly. I think that I've been studying it for 30 years. It's extremely complicated. But if you can get and distill the ingredients that make our lives easier. That's what I'm trying to do in this book is just give somebody a really simple tool. And I'm hoping that it's going to be one of these books that's by your bedside table and you're going to be wanting to look up your mother, your father, your boss, your sister, your brother. And then all of a sudden you'll go, oh, no wonder I get it. That's, that's because they're that way. That's why they are the way they are in my life. And it just helps. It just makes it calmer. Well, and it, it, Really, I mean, I, I'm all for the really coming from where a person's point of view is and, and gaining greater understanding about that because it's interesting. A lot of times when people have miscommunication, it's because they have different perspectives and they're not understanding where the other person is even coming from. They're like, well, gosh, you know, it's like that men from Mars, women from Venus kind of thing, you know? Right. <laughs> but once you understand it, then you don't then you don't take it personally because mm -hmm. the way I look at people, I'm a big dog lover. But if you have somebody who's got a Jack Russell Terrier, terriers are yappy. They're usually high strung too. That's just mm -hmm. you're not going to get mad at the Jack Russell for being that type of temperament. Just like if you have a Basset hound, that's a totally different type of energy. And people are the same way. There are some people who are feisty, direct and no-nonsense kind of thinkers, and there are other people who are soft-spoken and they don't like conflict and they're gentle with words, and there are other people who talk nonstop. There are some people who, you know, you, if you call them up, you know you're going to be on the phone for an hour with them because you can't get them to stop. So <laughs> it's not that they're good or bad. It's just they're all different flavors of communication styles, and it's so important to know because then you can work with it. Otherwise, you can drive yourself crazy thinking, gosh, I wish that he would be softer with his words because that's what I really need. But if that's not the way he's wired, you've got to figure out another way to get 
what you need out of that person. So um, for our listeners, what would be some of the key um, components of Mercury Retrograde that you would share with them? Well, the number one thing is if you can buy my book, you'll find out whether or not you were born with Mercury Retrograde or not. Um, oh, that's the other sure. thing. <laughs> that, that's the number one thing to understand because if you were born during Mercury Retrograde, you want to sign contracts, move forward, do everything you possibly can during those retrograde times. So in this case, in my life, I had my book come out on September 13th when Mercury was retrograde. And then two days later, I did a TED Talk in Hollywood, and everything Mm -hmm. went super, super well. And as soon as Mercury went direct, I ended up getting the flu. Now, I'm not saying that it was because (laughs) of that planet, but there are some patterns to this. But the people who are born during Mercury direct – when it does go retrograde and they've noticed that during those times they're not comfortable and they can't wait for these periods to be over, again, what I want them to do is think about this is a time when you're supposed to be in reverse and that it's not a negative thing because you couldn't parallel park your car if you couldn't put it in reverse. These are incredibly important times to just slow down and think about things that um, we need to do that we've put pushed aside because we're so busy going forward, like cleaning out your closets or having a garage sale. Those are great things to do during Mercury retrograde. And it doesn't mean you can't go forward. It just means you have to be a little more careful. Okay. Now, let's say we have uh, one of our listeners who wants to get in touch with you uh, for just trying to, you know, they've purchased the book and they want to learn more about how their astrology chart fits in with the Mercury retrograde. Um, Are you still offering private readings or workshops that they can go ahead and connect with you and do that? Yes, absolutely. They can just go to my website, which is lesliemcguirk.com, and it's M-C-G-U-I-R-K. And on there, there's also a Mercury calculator, which Mm -hmm. you can plug in your birthday or your boyfriend's or whatever, and you can see at least your Mercury sign, which and it gives a little description so, but you, it doesn't tell you whether or not you were born during retrograde or direct. But yes, I do private readings all the time. And the other thing I have now, because I'm really trying to make astrology more user friendly, I also have a webinar that explains the basics of astrology, and I sell that to people too. You can get it downloaded onto your computer. So that's another option for people. But I think that if more people knew how to use this as a tool, it's a navigational tool that's extremely accurate, I think life would be a lot easier for many people. And um, that's sort of what I feel my mission is right now, to try to demystify astrology. Well, and that really, that's a in, in some ways kind of a big undertaking because, I mean, obviously you've been studying this for over 30 years and you know your stuff. You know, for someone getting into this new, in, you know, as a new person, of course, purchasing your book, but then um, it sounds like taking the webinar would be a really great place to start. Well, I actually believe, probably because of my um, background in writing and illustrating children's books, I'm a very visual thinker. Mm-hmm. So when I do people's charts, I don't even use astrological language because most astrologers, they use all this fancy jargon that nobody knows what text they're talking about. So I make it fun and simple. And when I actually teach workshops in real life, which I love to do, and if anyone out there ever wants me to come and and do a group session, um, I love doing that because what I do is I bring costumes, I bring props, I bring music, and I actually bring these archetypes. I bring the chart alive. And when you do that, it's so much easier to understand it. And I believe in eight hours, if I work with people, like over a weekend, I can give you enough knowledge about astrology so that you can start reading charts on your own. I'm not saying you're going to be excellent, but you'll be able to know enough for it to be helpful. That's that's pretty impressive. <laughs> well, I think it's because I've made it super simple. I've made it yeah. – um, I remember when I was a kid trying to understand how to play chess, and I found it so complicated. And then someone bought me a, a board game called Smith, which was – for, for, for dummies, and all of a sudden I got it because they made it so simple, and so I think that's what I'm doing for people who want to understand astrology. I've made it so simple. There's no way you couldn't understand it. Well, and I think that gives people a great place to start. Now, so um, for the people who um, are coming, you know, like that are direct for Mercury Retrograde, and when Mercury Retrograde is done, 
what are some tips for them to kind of get, you know, things back in flow? Because sometimes people feel like they're just a little bogged down. I've heard that a lot. Where the, the, the effects of the mercury retrograde are still yeah, on. Yeah, where they just feel like they've had the double whammy, you know. All right. Well, it's true. For many people, they actually have that sensation. And all I can say is that, use the analogy again of your car, when you put it into reverse and you start to go forward, you have to put it through the gears. It has to go one, two, three, four. And the only way you can get a gear to get to the next level is to push in the clutch and then you're in neutral. You have to go through neutral before you get to the next level. So just think about don't go too fast. Move slowly and try to incorporate some of the things that I suggest that you do during Mercury Retrograde into your life, like meditating even five minutes a day. If you can do that, every morning or every night, that's humongous. That's just gigantic, and that will help a lot because that's the neutral. We need the neutral times in order to shift, and most of us are going so fast, and moving at the speed of light that all of us seem to be going, it's actually a symptom of immobility because when you're going that fast, you don't notice anything else. So I think all of us, including myself, need to remember to slow down and um, the only time that that I'm allowed to go zipping at full speed the way I love to is when it's retrograde. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, again, the other thing for those people to think about is have compassion for those of us who are wired the exact opposite way because we're dealing with that feeling that they have most of the time, that sort of funky feeling is sort of part of our normal. Well, and it can be such – I mean, it's. I, I just find it fascinating because um, I've never even considered – how life would be for somebody and, and I and just finding out that I'm, you know, was born during a retrograde, how that affects things. And now it makes, it really does make things very clear because a lot of times when people are just like spinning out of control during a retrograde, I'm having the time of my life. See, that's exactly <laughs> it. And, and until you read my book, you didn't know this. And so you were probably always mm-hmm. thinking, what is all this astrological nonsense out there about Mercury retrograde? Why is everybody so upset about it because in your case it's like this is when you should make hay while the sun shines this is like yes yeah, skipping through the daisies for us mm-hmm. and and you're 100 percent right because i've heard of just different news channels or um, metaphysical magazines that will talk about the retrograde and it and it's always the doom and gloom at least it seems that way to me you know when when they're discussing it, it's like oh it's so bad right now hold on hold on to your socks kind of thing you know well what's incredible there have been a, several books written about mercury retrograde and of course you when you see it again in these metaphysical magazines or wherever not once have I ever seen somebody talking about people who were born during Mercury retrograde. So, mm-hmm. again, it's one reason I wrote the book. There's 20% of the population who needs to know about this. And if you're one of them, then you definitely need to buy my book because then you're part of our tribe. <laughs> the 20% who are the quirky thinkers. Well, and if not, you know someone who's in the 20 percenters. Yes, and, exactly. You know, and so it helps to understand how to communicate with them just a little bit better because – you know, you know, it just life is difficult enough as it is, and anything we can do to make communication easier and better and more clear, I'm all for. Yes, and I'm also just for people to have more peace in their relationships. And just the other day I met this couple. They have three adorable children, and you can see the tension between the two of them. Um, yeah, both of them are having trouble communicating with each other, and I haven't looked up their chart yet, but I'm sure that they have very different Mercury signs. And once I figure out how they can bridge the gap between those two very different placements, They'll stop blaming each other because what happens until we have this knowledge, we we tend to get mad at the other person for not being like us. Mm -hmm. It's a very typical human thing to do. And um, that's where astrology comes in handy because we don't get mad, as I said, with a dog for being a particular way, but we'll get mad at a human if they don't talk to us the way we think they should be talking to us. Yeah, and it's just because we're we're communicating at uh, different levels there. So. Yeah, there are four styles of communication. There's a fiery way, which is very direct. They're usually very funny, sarcastic. Um, that's one way. Earthy people are very pragmatic, practical, and grounded, and usually not overly emotional. The water people are very emotional, very sensitive. They don't like screaming and yelling. The fire people 
enjoy a good fight once in a while. And then we have the air people, which are very intellectual. Sometimes they're a little dry, and sometimes they're not very emotional, which can be difficult for the people who are the more emotional types. So those are the four types you can see where there are, you know, like 144 combinations. Mm-hmm. And and so it really kind of separates all that out. Yes. Well, do you, you know, Leslie, I really appreciate you taking the time to be on the show with us here today. My goodness, you just a fountain of information. I can't recommend your book, The Power of Mercury, high enough. I think everyone should have a copy in their home so they're able to just understand and communicate with other people a little bit better. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us here today. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Leslie. And before we wrap up here today, I want to just take a little time to thank each and every one of you for writing in. We've uh, had some great show suggestions from the requests that have come in, and I do read every email that comes in and appreciate all of the feedback and, and the information. Also, if you have a veterans group or organization or company, Moments with Marianne is a proud supporter of our troops. And so I am looking for any groups that make a special impact in the lives of veterans and their families. Please feel free to reach out to me at Marianne at MariannePastana.com. Love to hear from you and learn a little bit more about what your group is all about. At Moments with Marianne, every month we highlight a new veterans group and like to have you submit your information to see if your group would be accepted for this highlight opportunity. So thank you for tuning in today. And remember, make every moment count. Join us next time for Moments with Marianne, when host Marianne Pestana brings another inspirational, gifted leader to help us grow. Tune in every second Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for Moments with Marianne, when the Dream Vision 7 Radio Network is at 1510 a.m. Boston. Or catch Moments with Marianne every Thursday and Friday at 5 p.m. and 5 a.m. Eastern Time by going to dreamvision7radio.com. To learn how Marianne started her business from the ground up, visit mariannepestana.com. Don't miss this. And remember, make every moment count.